All right, Mike Florio from Pro Football Talk joining us now on CHGO. Straight royalty on the show today, baby. We're not court playing. jester. That's <laughs> does that count as royalty? Oh, no, that's my job is the court jester. <laughs> you're 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 part hero, and then they're coming at you. Just this is the world we live in. You you love every second of it. That's don't right. You? What's the saying? You either hang around long enough to die the hero or you become the villain. Yeah. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. There it is. I'll die the villain. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're going out on top. That's, that's the plan. Well, yeah. And, um, uh, we obviously have nothing to talk about in Chicago. No, days. not a thing. Yeah. What um, a boring time. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to try to figure out, maybe we'll start here is what's the Justin Fields trade market like right now? Cause I keep getting like mixed reviews on how, Many teams are actually that interested. Here's my theory, and I may be giving the Bears too much credit, but but if it's true, they're very smart. I think they've been hoping that the phone will ring, and it hasn't, at least not the way that they had hoped. The comments this week from Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus, I think were calculated to just, just stick it to him enough to get him to ask for a trade. Instead of him saying, I just want to know what the answer is. At some point, that becomes, I want you to trade me. Because then, if they trade him out from under a trade request and they don't get much for him, they don't look as bad. Whereas, if they just don't get much for him and he didn't ask to be traded, they look like they blew it. So, I don't, again, I don't want to give him too much credit. But I don't think it was an accident that on the other side of that, curtain two days ago polls and Eberflus were kind of taking some shots indirectly when they talk about what they want in a quarterback that's not what their guy currently has and I feel like they're now hoping that maybe he says I want to bring this to a head so when they have to do a bargain basement basement sale they don't get embarrassed by what they get in return for. And you feel like that's almost close to that point because he's on, you know, Justin Fields goes on the St. Brown Brothers podcast and he's talking about, I just want an answer. I want to be done with this. And, you know, bringing up teams like the Falcons and talking about their roster and how much he likes playing in the, the stadium at Pittsburgh. So it does feel like he's close to that point. At one point, they took the odds off the board yesterday at DraftKings when the Falcons were an overwhelming favorite as the team where he'll take his next snap, then they put him back on. But the Falcons have kind of become that team. But yeah, they need to do something because March 13, and more importantly, March 11 at noon Eastern, when the free agents can begin to negotiate through their agents' contracts with other teams, what happens then is, let's say I'm a team looking for a quarterback. I got my list of quarterbacks I'm looking for. You call the first agent and you say, here's my offer. I need to know in five minutes what you're going to do because I got to get to number two before number two is gone. And then if number two is gone, I get to number three before number three is gone. So I need to know what you're going to do. So before that game of musical chairs happens, if you're the Bears, you better place Justin Fields somewhere because all these other guys and Kirk Cousins is going to be there who's been linked to the Falcons. His wife grew up in Alpharetta, Georgia. Her parents still live there and as the betting odds go, it's Vikings and then Falcons for him. So you've got Baker Mayfield, who has yet to sign with the Buccaneers. He's out there. You've got Russell Wilson, who's going to be cut on or before March 17. The Broncos haven't announced that, but that's going to happen. So you've got this game that you're playing where you better you better drop Justin Fields somewhere or you're going to be stuck with him. And then you're stuck with him until after the first round of the draft when you hope that a team that decided to wait for the draft to get its guy doesn't get the guy it wants and maybe we'll trade you a second round pick for Justin Fields. But that's a hell of a risk because if that doesn't work, then you get Justin Fields and Caleb Williams under contract going into 2024. Well, and you're setting up a pretty ugly scene, right? Like if, they, if Justin Fields is still on the roster the night of the draft and they draft a quarterback at one, just knowing Bears fans like we all do, I, I can promise you they will boo the pick. Yeah. They, they which will is not wild, be. which is crazy that we could be at this point with Caleb Williams and actually have Caleb Williams getting booed. Well, they booed <laughs> Mitch Trubisky, you well, know, I, yeah. but this is a much different circumstance. And we love everybody that watches this show. We love all Bears fans. It doesn't matter if they're booing, as long as they do the right thing. Don't worry about the fans. I yeah, mean, the boos are temporary. The cheers last forever. Yeah, but, right? but it is. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I, 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 think, <laughs> I, think, I think it was right on point. 
let, let me ask you. I think you had a follow up. Well, so I was just. I, I, we haven't talked about the whole, enough, honestly, about this idea of requesting a trade. But I'm just. We've seen. We see these scenarios play out in the NFL every single year with players, and I'm almost surprised that it hasn't gotten to that point. You, you just don't see GMs just, openly right. talk about. Yeah, we're trading or starting a quarterback like it's almost like inevitable. It, it's it's very odd. And you and normally in this situation, I feel like the players' side, the players' camp would have requested a trade by now. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And that is the next move that needs to happen. And you know what? From Justin Fields' perspective, look, the Bears want to maximize the return. And at one level, you could look at it as the player and say, oh, I want them to maximize the return because it's an ego thing. Look at everything they gave up to get me. The better approach is I want them to give up as little as possible. I want my next team to not be hamstrung by giving up a two or a one or whatever or this or that. I want to be a bargain basement because I want my next team to be fully equipped to put talent around me. So who knows? Maybe it's just like this weird game of cat and mouse at this point. But I thought they were very not that they were overt. But we picked up enough on Tuesday. They're going with Caleb Williams. So what's the end game with Justin Fields? And I really think they're hoping he asks to be traded because then when they get not much for him, and this is not a good year to get much for him with all these other options that are available at quarterback. This is not a year to have to trade for somebody. It's interesting. So Bill Belichick gets no interest this offseason. The Bears stick with Matt Eberflus. Let's just focus on the Belichick part of your mic. Why do you think that there was no market for arguably – a lot of people would call him the greatest coach in the history of the game. Robert Kraft put it best on the day that they parted ways. They did a joint press conference where they just read their statements, and then Kraft came back later and answered questions. And somebody asked him about Belichick's apparent willingness to take less power going forward. And Kraft said it wouldn't work. It would be too confusing. It would be too awkward. I think that same mindset applies anywhere else. Think of it this way. If a team hires Belichick to just be the coach and you got a GM who's 43 years old, comes in for the draft meetings and you got Belichick sitting there, your employee, the guy that answers to you, the guy that is second to you, the guy that has to defer to your choice. Is he really going to do it? Are you going to be comfortable doing that as a GM when you're working with a guy who's been fully in charge of the Patriots all these years? So I think there was no team that was comfortable putting Belichick into the current structure and there was no team that was comfortable blowing up the current structure and handing the keys to Belichick. I think Arthur Blank wanted to do it initially in Atlanta, wanted Belichick in there, but when it was clear that he was going to have to completely get Rich McKay out of the operation, completely just exile him away from football operation, I don't know that, but I just think from following the Falcons and understanding the way this all works, that was the impediment at the end of the day, so Rich McKay gets the guy there that keeps him viable and Raheem Morris is the coach. So over the course of the next year, will there be an owner that thinks, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to let Belichick run everything. I got one other tangent question for you. Because you've been doing this pro football start, started, what, 2001, right? Yes. How much impact, I mean, you're, you know, you're as prominent as can be. All the talk, though, everywhere, from ESPN all the way around. How much do you think teams are are concerned about what is being put out there, what's being said on all the shows that are happening all the time versus like maybe when you started? Like, How much are they just trying to always control the narrative and make decisions based on that? Some teams do, some teams don't. Some teams are smart about PR and some teams aren't. And there are situations where I think it's advantageous to work the media – to understand where you're going so the media can be, as the liaison to the fans, the device that gets the fans comfortable with what's coming so no one is surprised. And that's where the balance is. For teams, a lot of the stuff that you want to do is very strategic and secretive, and we don't want to tip our hand because then that hurts our, our effort to get what we want. On the other hand, you still have individual human beings who you're expecting to fork over money and time and emotion, and there's a balance there. But I know this. This is one thing that's been true at PFT, and I don't know why this happened. But a lot of the owners read everything that we write. And one of the reasons the league office hates me is when Roger Goodell's trying to enjoy his bagel and coffee, he gets a phone call from an owner who's pissed off about something I wrote, and now he's got to deal with it, and then I got to deal with it. But they pay attention. The owners pay attention to what's being said, and they are 
And I think they pay attention to all the media. I think that's one of the reasons why the coaching process is so imperfect, because what we say in the media does resonate. They listen to us because a lot of these owners think about it. And this is one of the things I love about the NFL. I hate it and I love it. It makes it so compelling. You've got multi-billion dollar, finely tuned football operations, and they are all ultimately mom and pop operations, right. as you guys well know. Yeah. yeah. But every team's like that. There's no test you have to take to own an NFL team. You have to take two different tests to drive a car for crying out loud. <laughs> All you have to have is enough money that you earned anywhere to buy the team. Or you got to be married or otherwise related to the right person who drops dead. Yep. Those are the qualifications. It's either or. And you own an NFL team. And you're in charge of this gigantic. And so you don't know what to do. And you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what you know. You don't know what you don't know. You don't want to expose yourself to your peers as not knowing anything. So they listen to the media. Yeah. Well, that, when you talk that, about being elite, the Bears. Yep. Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred percent, mom and pop. And, you know, I think George McCaskey wears that with pride. When you talk about, you know, us trying to be a li liaison to the fans, I mean, that's kind of the position we've been put in. Is, in our opinion, whether it's an educated opinion or not, we we believe they're going to move on from Justin Fields and and draft Caleb Williams, and we've been saying that for quite some time. And it's drawn a lot of visceral from our fan base, you know, for the fans that don't agree with that. You and Peter King, you guys work together. You guys have kind of been the beacon of hope for a lot of fans in Chicago that want to keep Justin Fields because a lot of times I've seen you say that you thought they should keep Justin Fields. And then Peter King writes his farewell, you know, uh, article, which was fantastic, and then drops a Bears bomb at the very end, which set Bears, you know, nation aflame. And so. You know, I think for your end of it, I think Bears fans have been looking to you guys and wondering why you guys are on the other side of the coin to that conversation. I'm a firm believer that the entire draft process is one big series of lottery tickets. You know, those scratch-off lottery tickets. And obviously, the biggest possible winners are the first ones, and then they go down in value. But if you can take that one that everyone wants and you can swap it for a bunch of other ones that are just a tier below, and maybe get a player who's already proven what he can do. When that's one option, plus you have a lottery ticket that isn't, you still got some of that, you know, that paint that you scratch with your quarter. You still have a little bit left. We don't know what Justin Fields is going to be. So you're throwing him back and you're going to use that ticket on Caleb Williams when there is absolutely no guarantee Caleb Williams is going to come in and do anything great. You look at the number one overall picks of the last 50 years and you look at him name by name and it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, God. Oh, all right. Oh, geez. So that you're, you're putting a lot of eggs in one basket. And this is the one thing I think teams don't take seriously enough. There's already a ton of pressure on this young kid coming to the NFL being the number one overall oh, yeah. pick. The circumstances add to it. Bryce Young last year, they gave up. Everything they gave up to get, they gave up DJ Moore and they gave up all these draft picks. What would have been the first overall pick this year to get Bryce Young? You add extra pressure to the circumstance. So now, okay, they take Caleb Williams. Well, there's going to be an apples to apples, Caleb Williams and Justin Fields. Yep. Wherever Justin Fields goes, oh, look, look how good Justin Fields is. Caleb Williams stinks. Not that he's going to stink, but I just think it's part of what you factor in. And I think the smart approach is let it ride with Fields and turn that Caleb Williams ticket, unless you are 100% sure that this guy is Patrick Mahomes, unless you are 100% sure he's Patrick Mahomes, you, you, you get more lottery tickets because then you have more players that make your team better. Yeah. It's so fascinating right now. Mike, you're the best. Yeah, we, Thanks, Laura, guys. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, you I'm, glad, I'm glad I'm glad I told you yes. Uh, also, you're, I was going to say, yeah, screw off. I'm too busy. <laughs> you're, you're, no, you're, I appreciate, appreciate it. it. I'm kidding. I'm also, kidding. You, it's you're, great. You're the best lead in for me every week when I go on. That's great. Seven the score. I hear your name every <laughs> Wednesday at 1120 a.m. Is there finally playing me off with the music because I talk too long as I always do? Yeah. Well, you bring in the audience and then I'm just there to capitalize. So there, that, yeah. That, so wait, <laughs> am I Kenny Banyer, Jerry Seinfeld? How did that used to work? Who was the lead in? Oh yeah, I know what you're talking I about. I think Ken. I think yeah. Kenny was trying to be the one who was siphoning off Jerry, and they tried to flip yeah. it around. Yeah, that's what it was. No, Kenny always followed Jerry. Jerry built the audience. So you're Kenny Band. Okay, I'll right. take it. You Excellent. want any shrimp from St. Elmo's? No, no, like thanks. In? <laughs> yeah. no right. thank you. Th thank no, you. No, thanks. All right. No, no, you stay for us. We he doesn't want it, but we do. <laughs> yeah, they want the shrimp. Right. Yeah, thanks. 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 We all city like the mayor. 